G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. Welcome everyone. Today I'm interviewing Diane Ray from Unique Enterprises based in Birches Bay, Tasmania. Thanks for your time today, Diane. Oh, you're welcome. And let's start with how we know each other. That's through Polly Venning here in Hobart, who we both know. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we do. Yes. Polly actually attended one of my very first cheese making courses about maybe 15 years ago. Right. That's okay. how I first met Polly. Yeah, great. And Birch's Bay, is that southeast of Hobart? How far, what's the drive, about 25, 30 minutes? Yeah, about 30 minutes south of Hobart, um, so about 10 minutes south of Kettering. Yeah, it's a beautiful spot down there. I love it. And you've got a great view from the, from the deck there as well. Mm. Tell our audience a bit about your business, what it does and how it makes money. We started off 18 years ago as a dairy sheep enterprise. So we would milk the sheep, make some sheep milk trees, and then sell the majority of it through our tasting room here on farm. So essentially tourism as well. In the last five years, that's evolved into incorporating a distillery where we actually use the whey, which is a waste product from the cheese making, and turn it into what is the only sheep whey vodka and gin in the world. And my son created that component of the business. Uh, and to this day, it's the only one that we know of. And it has won World's Best Vodka. And it's just been awarded the Australian Champion Vodka at the World Spirit Awards for the fifth year in a row. Yeah, I saw that on Facebook because I was in the distilling area for nine of the last 10 years. So, yeah, that's a phenomenal uh, achievement. Um, that, well done, Diane. That's huge. Mm. I mean, and most of it's based on flavour, and that really was um, serendipitous. Uh, you know, we had – Ryan had an idea to try and use some waste product that, that, that made distilling, which he was interested in, more relevant to the business. And um, <laughs> thank God it tasted great. <laughs> it does. I'm not a big vodka drinker, but that's about the only vodka I can drink neat. It's a really, really nice flavour. Thank you. And uh, you've got um, new, a new product range you're looking at launching soon? Yes. Yeah, so my daughter has created a product range called uh, UK. So the brand will be called UK, E-W-E. Um, and again, it's a way of us repurposing uh, the milk that we produce during the season that's not up to sufficient standard to make cheese from. So she has developed a skincare range and we'll be launching with a day and a night cream and the point of difference uh is twofold one is that uh it's based on sheep milk but it also has only five ingredients that we can all actually say and understand what they are um, mm. it's bespoke tasmanian including the ingredients and the packaging has zero plastic so the concept is we have a couple of beautiful uh, pods like they're like little clams uh, made by a local potter that are fired using the raccoon method essentially and we've fired our sheep wool on the outside so each individual pod is unique uh, the pods hold the cream and when you need a cream refill we actually send it to you the cream is in home compostable sachets right and when will that be launching? We might point people to the website to check it out. Yeah. So the website should be live in about four weeks and it'll be launching around June, July. Yep. Great. And which website's the best one to go to for that one? If they want to sign up right now, they can go to Grandview, as in G-R-A-N-D-V-E-W-E dot com dot A-U. Um, otherwise, in about a month, it'll be ucare.com.au. Yep. And if they just sign up to the newsletter, then they'll get advanced knowledge of when the launch is happening. And you care as in the sheep, the play on words mm -hmm. there. Yep, that's yes. great. Mm. I love we it. do like a good sheepy pun, Troy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I haven't cornered the market on dad jokes by, by the sounds of it. Um, <laughs> and <clears throat> just out of interest, is there much of a, an issue with supply of the way going into you, – you've got gin and vodka – 
Is that a, a real constraint for you guys? Uh, it wasn't. It is becoming so. Um, and the reason being, uh, and, and this will this will talk to growth of businesses, which we'll get into later, but the reason being we have made a decision to retain the, the cheese making at the level that it is. Um, at this stage, there's more than enough whey and we still have whey, excess whey to feed to the sheep. Um, however, we are now looking at a system where we can freeze that excess whey so that we have more available when we're not making cheese. So most people don't realise that sheep only milk seven months of the year. So um, off season, you know, what do you do for fresh whey? Uh, what do you do for cheese? And, and they're systems that we have now finished our R&D on and are about to launch into, you know, new, um, new items here on farm to, mm -hmm. to get over those sorts of hurdles. But uh, uh, we've just taken on a new still, which is four times the capacity of our current stills. So the demand for way moving forward will increase. Um, but we, we think we've got that covered. Yeah, fantastic. No, it sounds like you're a very innovative family down there in Birch's Bay. <laughs> mm, always have been, and the children have no choice because they've got my DNA in them. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know Ryan uh, from the industry actually when I was at Lark, and we actually played a few games of netball together as a bit of a, the distilling crew netball team here in Hobart. Yeah, right. And tell our audience how you started out. I, uh, a former partner myself, came to Tassie for a holiday and fell in love with the place. I'm a Queenslander, and when I came down here, it was the only place that I've ever really had that sense of feeling at home. So we decided to move down here. Then we had to figure out how to make an income. He was a lawyer and used to drink a lot of wine. I'm sure he still does. Um, <laughs> he figured out it was time that he go back to the industry. So we decided that we would plant a vineyard. So we planted 7,000 vines in our front paddock. And then I said, well, look, we need to make some income while these vines are growing. I came up with the idea of sheep uh, and sheep milking. I'd done my market research. It's always important when you start a business to look at uh, what is the market, what is your addressable market, mm -hmm. and what is your reasonable addressable market, meaning the more market is what's available to you, but the reasonable addressable market is really what can you actually access with your tools, yep. which could be, you know, if you're rough and ready going to food shows or a little bit of free social media, um, you know, and as you go up that scale, your reasonable addressable market increases. So it's really who, who can you actually talk to in that addressable market? So um, I done my research, realized that the addressable market was wide open in Australia and I've always, I've always really only run businesses where I've been the innovator and the leader. I don't think I would do very well in an industry that that was that was fairly tertiary, that was fairly settled, where supply and demand were equal. I'm much better with sunrise industries rather than sunset industries. Yep. So we started on that path, got a uh, uh, new industry development grant to build. The, the factory and the, the tourist outlet and did that. And to cut a long story short, the relationship didn't survive and neither did the vines. So <laughs> we got rid of both and things have been a lot better ever since. Right, um, right. We planted the vines in an area that is extremely windy. Uh, yeah. Um, so they didn't, they didn't do that well, which is a fortunate thing really because the sheep did a lot better. And what was your background before you started this up? Um. Originally, uh, my first degree was in psychology. So I started off as a psychologist until I was 25 and I was only working for the government. That was really in those days. I'm talking, Jesus, 40 years ago. Yep. Um, that was really your only employer. Uh, I didn't fit well in the public service. So during that time, I did a graduate degree in marketing and management. And then I left and set up my own business in financial planning and insurances right at the beginning of the concept of what is financial planning. So again, I looked at it and I saw it as an holistic approach, um, did one of the first degrees of financial planning in Australia from Deakin University. So that was my third degree. So did a whole lot of that for a while, got to the point at about probably 
33, 34, where I realized that everything I was selling was based on either greed or fear. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't want to move forward in my life with those energies around me. So I actually sold my business, set up a multidisciplinary um, health center uh, through in, in Brisbane. I uh, did that for quite a few years and then basically sold the lot, moved to Mullaney, um, set up a self-sufficient lifestyle up there and did that until we moved to Tasmania. Yeah, great. So 2003 was the move down here? Uh, 2001 right. moved down and then opened the business 2002. In 2002, great. And so what? how old were you and your mate decided to start this business up in 2002? God. I haven't had enough coffee about, today to work all those numbers out you've just said. <laughs> so I would have been um, about 45. Yep, yep. Mm. Great. And do you have some key numbers you can share to illustrate the growth of the business over the 18, 19 years? Yeah, I mean, it was really a, um, a basket case for many years. Uh, it's like any small agribusiness, any artisanal business. Um, you limp from month to month, week to week. And, you know, that's not a lot of fun. I mean, right in the beginning, even before we had the mission statement that we've got now, someone put me on the spot after I won the Rural Women's Award in 2004 and said, you know, what's your, what's your corporate mission? And I said, well, to have fun, make profit, tread lightly upon the way. So it, that really hasn't changed because if you're not making a profit, you're actually, you're not having fun. No. I mean, the stress levels, et cetera, are just through the roof. Yeah. And tread lightly upon the way, we have evolved into a business that significantly focuses on food repurposing. And that started off its infancy probably about five years into the business. And now, um, you know, it's extreme with the sheep milk whey and the excess bad milk and a couple of other ideas that we're hoping will come to fruition soon with regard to disposal of the waste product from the distillery, which you would know, Troy, being in the distillery is a nightmare. You know, you can pay people to take it away, but really, aren't you just paying them to make the problem go away, yeah. the environment yeah. problem go away so that it's out of sight, out of mind. So we have a solution to that. We are trying to, we're um, looking at a couple of grants at present to try and raise some funds uh, to put that in on farm. So growth-wise, getting back to your question, um, it's really only been the last two or three years that we've started to see significant growth. The distillery has certainly helped in that regard given that we have three family members and mouths to feed, um, a business really has to be of a significant size for that to happen. Um, You go through a stage of, you know, working in the business and then having to work in the business and on the business at the same time. And where does that stage where the majority of our time we're working on the business more than in the business. So yeah, as you go through that growth, things like that happen. Um, We, have been on a significant growth path, as I said, the last couple of years, and we've had about a 40% compound annual return yep. on growth, less so with COVID. Mm. Um, we've certainly held our own in COVID, but we haven't seen the continuation of that growth. It's starting again, but certainly for the first nine months, we were just holding our own. Yep. We do have a growth plan, a three-year growth plan, where we have set the bar to doing what's called 10 times growth. So we're looking for a 10 times growth, uh, which is an exponential growth of around 50% per annum mm-hmm. compound. Uh, that's a big one. So we, we have the tools to do it. We were fortunately upskilled by the um, growth clinic in the University of South Australia in the last year um, to upskill our business skills to do that. And now the challenge is on. So. Um, for us to achieve it sounds like the perfect family to go for an audacious audacious goal like that (laughs) i mean there's some there's some pretty clear basics for that that i'd love to share with uh, with the listeners yeah the first the first basic the first really big aha for us was actually having the right team and that's a pretty you know pure old statement oh yeah of course you need the right team but it's like what does that look like and what it really looks like is that you really need staff uh, team members around you that are on the bus. Mm-hmm. So 
you know, if our bus is going from Melbourne to Adelaide, then we need, everyone needs to know that they're going to go from Melbourne to Adelaide. You can have people on the bus that actually think they're going to Sydney. Well, that's fine, but they need to get off the bus. Yeah. And then you've got people that have no idea whatsoever where the hell you're going. Um, so, you know, why are you working here? Oh, because it's a job, uh, because it pays the bills, um, because it's the only thing I can get in the region. Uh, you know, when you start hearing those sorts of comments, particularly at an interview stage, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, one guy recently, you know, we interviewed and, you know, why would you like this job? And um, it was like, well, because I'm working at this other place and I don't really enjoy it. Um, and I've got a family and family is really important to me, but I want to spend more time with my family. So I need something local. It's not as an employer what I needed to hear. Mm -hmm. Um, also people that turn up to interviews and know nothing about you. Oh, that's why first question I ask. Brand you. Oh, exactly. It's <laughs> the know? first question I ask in an interview. So Jesus. tell us, what do you know about our business? And if they can't answer that, I end uh, the interview pretty quickly because they obviously haven't taken the time or yep. effort to do some fucking research, which is just exactly. recruitment 101 for Christ's sake. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the last thing you do is just sit in an interview and say, because I need a job. Yeah. Oh, fuck me. Yeah, it's not yeah, that's not the attitude and passion we're looking for. Sorry. No. Whereas in the past we've employed people because I don't know, they seem nice, they're a good mate, friend of a friend um said they need a job. Uh you know, there was really no purpose in how we employed people. And so what happens is you end up with poor fits. Yeah. And that creates a great deal of angst both for management and for the individual. And and it ends in tears, Troy. Yeah, totally it agree. Ends in tears. And I think a lot of small business owners, uh, they don't know what they don't know in this corner of recruitment. It's just how important yeah. and powerful it is. If you don't go upstream and really bulk out your recruitment procedures, the questions, even the job ads you're putting out yeah. there, you, you, you're going to end up with B and C players or assholes on the bus. Mm. And it just grinds the business slowly along the road as opposed to having A players that are all aligned with your mission and vision and yeah. got the same passion yeah. for what you're doing yeah. and just, just yeah. Exactly. And, you know, there's a wonderful grid that we were given that's sort of like, you know, um, high, low ability, high ability and, and high values, low values in terms of company values. And, you know, there can be people that are highly uh, productive. For example, it might be a salesperson that's, you know, doing the best month out of anyone consistently. But if they don't get your values, then they're actually not a great member of the team and they need to get off the bus. Yep. And be, well, hang on, they're bringing in the money. But they actually have to do both for that business to to grow and to work through and I mean you know we say we say to people that you know we're quite happy to sort of slow the bus down and even stop it if they need to get off the bus yeah there are others that we know need to get off the bus and there are some that we've actually kicked off at 100 kilometers an hour <laughs> it's like just get off the fucking bus yeah. <laughs> don't get the hints yep. you know, we will slow the bus down for you then see you later open the door and just you know they need to go yeah. Because they can do so much damage to your business. Absolutely. And you, you using the bus analogy and talking about this very important point up first, which is the right people on your bus. I assume you've read Jim Collins' Built to Last or Good to Great? Yeah. 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 So yeah. true. And people aren't your most important asset, the right people on get sorry people aren't your most important asset the right people are. Get the right people on, the wrong people off and as importantly, yeah. the right people in the right seats. Oh, but, you know, Troy, that's not being a nice person. And, you know, they've got a family to feed. And, I mean, we've gone through the whole lot. We've ended up in tears. Yeah. Mm, it's hard. Yeah. Mm. When I say firing people, as you know, as an employer, you can't fire unless there's a real reason. Money in mm. the till, drugs mm. on board, uh, bullying. You know, we've we've had all of those. Yeah. And, you know, and they've gone, sorry, sorry, sorry. And, you know, we've been in tears mm. firing them. Yeah. Um, but the reality is, you know, if the business doesn't survive, then none of your other employees that are great people and are there for the right reasons, they're not going to be there either. They'll be out of a job. We have a huge responsibility mm -hmm. as an employer to make sure that that's right. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. What, what was so some that was of, the one of the basics? Yep. That, sorry, yeah, that was one of the basics. <laughs> um, and and it was really easy once we had this grid um to sort of go through our staff and go you know where are they on this grid um so that was a seriously important basic the reason why it's a basic is that if you get the team right you know it drives itself they're the ones that are motivating themselves to do the right thing and 
in, in many ways you can be, you know, hands off the steering wheel for some time and know and trust that the business is, is being looked after. So very important. Um, one of the, the other basics that we learned is, you know, what is growth? Um, don't chase the shiny butterflies. Mm -hmm. And that was very important for us because some businesses have problems innovating. We don't have that problem. We have the opposite problem. I've always been able to see business opportunities in lots of different things. And my kids are the same. But now we have the discipline around, is that chasing butterflies? Is that what we are and who we are? So the first part of that is to actually have, you know, I mean, we rail against corporatization, like mission statements and purpose and, well, what is it? Well, you know, we've got one. Well, what is it? Well, you know, I don't know. We feel it here in the heart, but well, what is it? So they made us actually come up with a why. Yep. And it's like, why do, why do you exist? And your why is the most important component. And the thing is that once you write down the why, then everything else starts to fall into place. Yeah, it makes sense, doesn't it? All right. Yeah. So for us, our purpose has the word sheet milk in it, you know, so we make, you know, we, we do it for the fun of positive disruption and we make exquisite products based on sheet milk. That, da, da, da. So yeah. what it means is that if we say, oh, we can make this product and we probably could, it doesn't, doesn't relate back to sheet milk. Does mm. it relate back to our core business? And then part of the, um, Part of the values that we've got is about, you know, repurposing, treading lightly on this earth, making sure things are recycled. We're not 100% fantastic, but we spend a lot of time looking at, you know, packaging. And I mean, we were the first ones in Australia to put cheese in a home compostable cryovac bag and so on and so forth. So little fellas can make a big difference. Yep. So why it's import important to know your why is because then it drives you. And then if you come up with some ideas, you say, is that chasing butterflies? Because mm. when you are ready for growth, you must laser focus on what you're growing. Now we have, well, four, did have four components to the business, three, three in a bit. So we had the cheese tree, we had the distillery, we had tourism. Now tourism was 35% of our turnover. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we're about to launch a new product and the growth experts are saying, you know, you've got four businesses. That's yep. ridiculous. You need one, you need one. Um, and so with COVID, we got rid of the tourism. Why? Because whilst it makes a net profit, it's maybe, you know, 10 to 15% hospitality is never an easy yeah. game. And it's like, where do we want to spend our time? Well, the distillery has a growth projectile of, you know, over 40%, 50%. Yep. Um, the cheesery, we decided would just limp along. We just keep it where it is because, trust me, to do um, a product that is not shelf stable, that has a use by life, that has HACCP and food safety around it, it takes a lot of time and energy to produce the same dollars that you can get out of something like a distillery. Yeah. We also have done our homework with the new brand, UCARE, and realised that, in fact, the growth projectile there is over 80 to 100%. Wow. What we say is, all right, what parts of the business are doing the best turnover and the best margins? Because it's not just about turnover, it's about margins. Mm -hmm. And since we, we made that decision in March, COVID March, we call it COVID mm -hmm. March, um, we lamented the loss of face-to-face -face contact and we lamented the loss of 35% of our turnover, but we've actually replaced that within eight months mm -hmm. with the rest of our business. So we've been able to focus on increasing that turnover from the other aspects of our business that have a greater margin. Yep. That's great. Yeah. That's very, very smart. And what about um, number of full-time equivalents you started out and where you were at just before COVID hit? Well, in the bad old days, we had two FTEs, myself and my former partner. So we'd milk the sheep, make the cheese, you know, taste it at the cellar door. Uh, then Ryan joined fairly soon after that. Um, prior to COVID, we had 
I think it was around 20 FTEs. Yep. And now we have 10. 10, because the other 10, because you've stopped the tourism. It was hospitality. Yeah, it was mostly, it was that area. But more importantly, actually, in the, in the cheese factory, we've actually increased our efficiencies mm -hmm. as well. So it was taking up another one or two FTEs, and we've been able to increase that efficiency there as well. Yep. Terrific. When was the moment you felt like you'd succeeded? It was April 2018. That's very and specific. <laughs> yes, two things happen in one week. So the issue with the ex-partner being a lawyer is it took us 10 years to extract ourselves legally from him. Yep. Um, he had a second mortgage on here, so we were stymied for 10 years in being able to refinance. We were running businesses on credit cards and, you know, really stupid stuff we had no choice yep. with. Um the last ditch effort to get some mediation was successful, thank God. And that was this particular week in April. The same week in April, Ryan's uh, vodka won world's best vodka. Yep. So we had these two double whammies in the week. We celebrated for a week. <laughs> sensational. Yeah. And really that was the turning point for the business. It, it changed up all the energies. Yep. Um, it lightened our load emotionally extracting ourselves from the ex-partner mm -hmm. um, and winning the award, you know, people kept saying, you won't know what this means. Yeah. Like this, it was Ryan's lifelong goal to win world vodka. Um, and he won it sort of the second year in. So. Yeah. It's great. Um, very much a turning point. That's mm. phenomenal. Great. And what does success look like to you? Still hard work, Troy. <laughs> um, it still means hard work. Yeah. Uh, for me, success is a double-edged sword. I was going to say sword. It's not really a sword, though. One is, um, you know, people keep saying to me, oh, my God, you work with your family. Because myself and my two children are the owners mm -hmm. and directors of Grandview. And that has its moments. Um, most of the time, I'm a business partner. Uh, every now and then, I'm a mother in a business. And that's interesting when you need to pull kids in line or they're acting out or they're disruptive and, you know, they're in their child rather than in their adult. Mm -hmm. um, so that's always interesting, but um, it's also been wonderful watching them grow as business individuals and also to understand each other's differences. Uh, and we have learned to understand the differences are the key to a successful business. Mm. You can't surround yourself with like-minded individuals where you do not have the depth and breadth available to grow your business. So mm -hmm. they are both different individuals and they have learned to respect that of each other and understand each other's strengths and weaknesses. So watching my children who are adults grow into that role, I find very rewarding mm -hmm. and watching the business now growing uh, is extremely rewarding and certainly is the reason I get out of the bed of, of the morning. You know, we've always got something new on the horizon, some new innovation that we're having to drive and push towards. Yeah, great. Number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a fast-growing business? We, um, we were doing some digital marketing, certainly before COVID, um, and we also understood that digital marketing is the marketing of the present and the future. Um, all ways of marketing, uh, you know, get a sales force, go out there, talk one on one, sell to someone, is really old world mm -hmm. garbage. Oh, there are some industries that's still probably relevant in, but really, unless you're across digital marketing these days, you're really not across marketing at all. And digital marketing, I remember an aha moment, I was talking with someone about two years ago about how it can all be automated. What do you mean? I said, well, he said, well, you know, you can touch a client, they can sign up for your newsletter and then they buy something. And, you know, when they buy something, the automated system says, hey, Roy, thanks for buying this. We really appreciate it. And then when, then they know that in 10 days time, they'll show Troy something else. And then if he bites, he goes to the next level. Um, and so there are these automated marketing systems where they actually take you on the journey. So that journey can be automated, whereas the journey used to be with a one-on-one -on -one salesperson. 
you know, g'day Troy, what can we get for you this week? You know, how did you find the late, latest computer? And, you know, um, so I got really turned on by automated um, client relationship systems and understood how powerful they would be. And so we started on our journey to incorporate that COVID hit and we uh, powered that up at a million miles an hour. So we went full on into, into digital. I mean, now we actually have bizarrely, I never thought we would have five different external consultants in digital. We've got uh, a web designer who, yes, he's designing our new websites, but he's also designing our look in anything we do. So if we package anything, if we send anything out in the mail, you know, his designs across it in terms of what messages are giving, how does it tell our story, da, da, da. We actually have a copywriter to write copy for the website. Uh, I wouldn't believe I had to do that, but we do. And she's very smart. It's a very smart, under, I think, underutilised um, skill. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so the stuff, it's like, well, can't we just cut and paste what's on the website? And, uh, <laughs> no. No, it's not good enough. We, we have, as the head of that team, a digital marketing consultant. She's brilliant. Found her on an Oz Industry uh, webinar during COVID. And what she does is the overarching, you know, these are the campaigns we're doing. These are the promotions we're doing. This is how we do it. We've got a social media team, another external consultant who puts together all the social media in accordance with what she wants them to do. And she integrates the um, automated CRM system for us. It's such a good system that when someone buys from us, and God, I hope no one on this um podcast is going to see this but um so they buy from us and they get this really lovely picture of us in a paddock and saying look we really appreciate you buying from us because we're a small business and Mm -hmm. you know we're artisanal and this means a lot to us because this helps us keep doing what we're doing so it, it very much is a heartfelt message from us but it is automated and i would get seven or eight personal emails a week back saying thanks guy for your email Mm-hmm. But obviously don't realize it's automated <laughs> and we really love your products and you know and 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 so yep. you know it works a treat <clears throat> it means that we can keep communicating with our tribe in a very efficient way um so yeah i i love digital marketing and if anyone is trying to create a business and they're selling a product and they're not across digital, digital marketing or have a consultant to help them mm. then they will be losing out in a big yep. in a big way yeah, it's great. I love online marketing, digital marketing, the, um, you know, the measurability of it all, the scalability. It's just mm. wonderful, wonderful. I mean, in the old days, Troy, you know, we'd, uh, we'd get an ad in the newspaper. Mm-hmm. And it might cost $1,000 if, if it was a little one-eighth page. And we'd say, hello, you know, I'm this and I've got this wonderful product. And how do you track that? You can't. Yeah. You know, you might see some sales going up and you might assume that that's come from the ad. Maybe it has, maybe it hasn't. But it's basically what I call um, pay and spray. Yeah. So yep. pay the money, spray out the message to God knows who and hope that it hits someone. So digital marketing will laser focus the money spent and you can see it immediately. So, you know, you, you buy ads, social ads. Um, you know, we'll spend a thousand dollars a month on Grandview. We spend a thousand on Heart Sean. Mm-hmm. And yeah. at the end of that month, we can see exactly how many sales for each section we got. We can see which ads outperform the other ads. So we can start laser focusing our communication. You can't do that with the old, the old advertising systems. Well, I was going to say that old, that old marketing yeah. adage of 50% of advertising spend is wasted. You just mm. don't know which 50%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about funding your business growth over the years? Maybe talk a bit to that. Yeah, um, it's always the hardest thing for small business yep. uh, because really the only opportunity as a small business that we have is debt funding. Um, you know, you hear things like equity funding and angel investors, and trust me, when you start looking into it, um, they are really not opportunities for funding your business. So. Unfortunately, it's debt funding. Uh, we, uh, our majority of our debt funding here is um, based on, you know, mortgage on the real estate. Mm-hmm. Uh, the bank owns everything, including our underwear, uh, <laughs> which is very, very common for a small business. And then they dictate to you how much of that they will give you to run your business. Um, you're up 
your only opportunity apart from that is credit cards. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have run the business uh, on credit card. Um, I mean, I, I remember someone saying to me, you know, what's your, um, you know, what's your, your working capital for your business? And I'll go, well, what's that? And they said, well, you know, the capital that you've got set aside for your everyday, you know, cash flow, highs and lows. And we said, well, we call that a bank card. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. um, and I mean, we, we've <laughs> gone through the situation where, all right, money comes in the door. We say, okay, who do we need to pay? Yep. And you pay someone. And then a week later, someone says, well, what about me? And you think, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, and they're a big one. Yep. So yep. the stress of not having effective cash flow, whereas, whereas now we have a cash flow manager who, you know, we just we just say to the person, look, we want to buy a new forklift, please. Yep. Mm. It's going to cost forty grand. And, and he goes, when do you want to buy it? And we say at this time. And he goes, all right, I'll put that into cash flow. So he puts it into cash flow. So there's no nasty surprises in four months' time when we know we have to have a you know forklift. So cash flow management really is king, and it's the hardest thing mm. because small business owners need to be everything to everyone. You know, they've got to understand accounts. They've got to understand, I mean, you know, you can do cash flow in zero uh, now at least. And, and the minimum they need to do is get across something like zero yeah. or maybe QuickBooks or my um, And if they don't, then they need to try and employ someone. And that's the problem. You know, you're, you're running so close to the wire that you either try and do the job yourself and either do it not well or maybe you've got some cash and then you've got to choose where do you put that cash. It's, it's a hard position to be in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. What about grants? You mentioned you did get some, you've had oh, some. Yeah. 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 No, I am the grant queen, Troy. <laughs> so yeah. early on in the business, um, I learned that grants can be your friend. They mm -hmm. can also be your enemy um, and publicity. So if you're doing anything innovative, new, you need to tell the world yep. because publicity is free and it builds your brand. Yep. So yep. rather than pay for socials, da, 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 um, you can do it through publicity if you've got something, an innovative story to tell. But with regards to grants, majority of grants are, are dollar for dollar. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got to say, do I really, really need this money? Because you think, oh, well, they're paying 50% of, of the money. However, it doesn't work that way. I got, I got caught. Uh, we had a grant, a uh, food grant that was $200,000. So we had to put 200 grand to it. So we had to borrow the 200 grand, uh -huh. $400,000 that we had to spend. The $200,000 from the government came down into our account in one financial year, All right? Now, when that money hits, that money is treated as taxable income. Right. Hmm. So this is, you know, we're a business that, I mean, we had tax losses. Hmm. Um, so in one year, we made a $200,000 uh, profit. Yeah. yeah. If you say your, your net profit was zero. Yeah. Of that, you're paying whatever, 30, 40 cents in the dollar, depending on what your tax rates are, whether you're business or private. So, you know, take 30 or 40% off that money and that's your real mm -hmm. dollar in, in there. So essentially what is a 50% grant in terms of what you get in your hand is more like 20 or 30%. So, and then it's important to make sure they're going to pay you over different tax years. So yeah, if we would yeah. have figured it out, you know, we could have got a drop in May and then another drop in July. So at least would have only added a hundred grand each year onto, yep. you know, the bottom line. Um, so you need to understand that that's taxable income uh, for start. Yeah. What about export? Are you guys looking at export at all? Or, or? Uh, yes, we are now. Mm -hmm. uh, right from the beginning, people would say, you know, are you exporting? Which is the most stupid question you can ask an artisanal business. Mm -hmm particularly in uh, with a product that has, you know, a sh shelf life. A shelf life. Yep. Why is that a stupid question? Because export increases your risk. Mm. It can increase your potential return, but it increases your risk. So until you have tapped out your addressable market in your mm. town, in your city, in your state, and then in your country, yep. it would be very silly to look at export. Yep. We are now starting to look at it for the distillery mm -hmm. um, about looking at it, getting information. I've just spent two days on webinars upskilling yep. 
as to, you know, what is export. And you've really got to know which country you're going into, what the market is there, where do you fit into that market? How do you go into the market? How do you find people that are going to deal with your product in the market? For example, last week I learned that, you know, America is basically 50 countries. Each is. state is different for boots. Yep. I think, oh, well, you know, that's great. Let's go into America. However, you need to get a distributor going to America, but the distributors do not sell your product. No. So you've then got to have a sales force team on the ground in America selling your product. And then what the distributor does is basically do the warehousing and the Importing. acceptance of product, yeah. you know, and, and logistics. Mm -hmm. um, and you think far out because in Australia, our distributors, you know, I mean, they take 30 to 40%, but mm -hmm. they're meant to sell the product. Yep. Now, understanding that American, you know, distributors don't do that is a really important aspect of that. And, you know, are you big enough? Do you want to have a sales force on the ground? Can you afford to employ someone over in America to sell your product? Do, if you do, are they the right person? Um, are they, you know, you're trying to deal with them. You're in Australia, they're in America. So um, there's a lot of risk associated with export. And I would only recommend that a business look at doing that if they really have fulfilled their addressable market in Australia. Yeah, I agree totally. And have you looked at the EMDG, Export Marketing Development Grant? Yes. Yeah. What about the yeah. Export Finance Loan? Have you looked at that? Yeah. Yeah, great. But again, um, they they pay you back, uh, yeah. you know, usually dollar for dollar once you've spent the money mm. and you've gone into the market. So um, one of them, you've got a list of spent 15 grand. Yep, yeah. EMDG, yep. Yeah exploring the market to do that so yes there's money once you export but getting the export right in the first place needs to come before that decision yes. because you can if you go into a shit country and your product's there and you don't get paid getting a dollar back for every two dollars you've spent is still a loss yes that's right yep if you were to start up today with plenty of funding would you go into your industry in my industry mm. Um, I wouldn't go into the sheep milk industry unless it was a, a fuck off amount of money and <laughs> I could, and I could build a large sheep dairy. Yeah. Right. If I could build a large sheep dairy. I mean, uh, really to build a significant sheep dairy. Um, and then you've got to have your manufacturing with that because the sheep milk industry is, you know, we talk about sunrise and sunset industries. It's still at the pre-dawn stage in Australia. Really? I was going to ask well, how there big are only is five, milk? There are only five real sheep milkers in Australia making product. Wow. So okay. you can't, I mean, we're very fortunate. We have two farmers in, in Tasmania that are milking for us mm -hmm. exclusively. Um, but nowhere else in the country has anyone been able to find people to milk for them. Uh, you know, cow industry, you either milk the cow or you make the product or yep. you sell the product. In the sheep dairy industry, you've got to do everything along the chain. Got it. Everything. So you've got to have the skills that will cover off all those areas. Yeah. Can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so our audience can learn from it? Oh, God, there were so many, um, <laughs> Troy. Um, yes, September 2012. Mm-hmm. September 2012, I called the two children in for a meeting and I said, we are technically insolvent. Uh, for those small business owners listening to this, if you are insolvent, it is against the law to continue in business. Mm -hmm. Insolvency means that you don't have enough current cash to meet current creditors yep. in a timely manner. Uh, we were insolvent and had been for a couple of months. And I said, I'm sorry, but we are going to have to wind down this business. Mm -hmm. up. And strangely, it was Ryan who came out and said, no. Yep. I said, what do you mean? No. He said, no. And I'm going to put a plan in place. So he, we called it austerity month for the whole month. We took zero wages. We lived off, lived off our own personal bank cards. We chowed down, did what we could, cut efficiencies, um, and then in 2013, we actually were profitable for the first time ever. Wow. Yeah. Ever. So uh, that was very much a turning point. So, you know, when push came to shove and I, I put up my hand and said, you know, really, we need to be out of here. Yeah. Uh, he said, 
he dug his heels in and said, no. Fuck that. This, no. this is before the distillery days. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. that's, yeah, that is great yeah. fortitude from uh, your children. Mm, mm. And what area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most at the greatest value? I, I think relationships, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, me personally, I'm a leader. I'm not a manager. Mm-hmm. So, you know, my byline is just go on, get on and do the job. Yep. Why, why, why can't you just get on and do the job? <laughs> so I've had to learn a lot. I've had to learn a lot about, um, you know, making time and going out of my way to say to, to staff that are doing a great job, you're doing a great job. Yes. Hmm. You know, it's, so because otherwise if they don't hear from me, then they assume, they don't assume they're doing a great job. No, Whereas I guess if they weren't doing a great job, they'd hear from me. So I've really had to learn to manage um, and, and understand those sort of relationships. Yeah. yeah. I made a term up for that. It's called managing by exception, which is, just human nature. You typically don't give anyone feedback or talk about something until they fuck something up. And you mm. haven't mentioned anything about the 10,000 things they got right up until the point they made one mistake. Yeah. Um, so you really, I'm, I'm wired the same way as you've just described. So I have to work on um, that building that professional relationship with people and giving feedback um, consistently positive as well as adjusting feedback. It's yeah, it's, mm. it's hard. Mm. What what have you enjoyed the least about managing the fast growth? I, I don't know. I mean, I really enjoy it because it's it's part of who I am to because with fast growth, it's about it's exciting. Mm-hmm. You know, it's an adrenaline rush. It's uh, making things happen, uh, reaching targets, and yeah, I, I find that exciting. When things are just coasting along. There's no real new ideas. We're just doing the same as we've always done. That's when, you know, when I start, and, and my children too, start to lose interest. Yep. Mm. And what do you love most about growing a small business? The challenges. The, you know, it, it's such a wonderful uh, field for creativity and thinking outside the square. Um, you know, in the old days, we had to think outside the square for debt. You know, how do we, how do we fund the yep. business when, you know, when the banks didn't want to know us and certainly an equity investor wouldn't, would laugh at us if we even tried to approach <laughs> them. And, and, you know, there was, there were no angels. I mean, angel investors don't exist um, if your business is in the toilet. Yep. So it's, you know, how do you creatively deal with that and how do you save money and how do you spend it wisely and so on? I think the creativity of small business I find interesting and the fact that we can change on a dime. Yep. So we're not the Queen Mary. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't take us a day and a half to turn the ship around. Yep. If yep. something's going wrong, as long as we've got the finger on the pulse, then we can sit down and say, okay, what can we do? How can we turn this around? What are our other options? And then work with those. Yep. Yep. And what's been the biggest mindset shift for you in your small business growth journey? I think understanding that the business is its own beast. And I am a cog in that wheel. Um, I am not the business. Uh, The business is this God that we have to bow down to and make sure that it's healthy and gets all the right food and if we do all the right things for this god then we get the most amazing rewards back in return yeah and what's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain keeping your eye on the ball you need to have up-to-date financials Mm -hmm. um in the dark days you know ex-partner uh who had fingers on the financials um you know, when I'd say I need, I need data, I need to look at where we're up to it. The excuse was always, well, I don't have time to bring the figures up to date. So every quarter you've got to put in GST. Mm. And so by then you've got, you've got data that is three months old, yep. say four months old by the time it's submitted. Um, you can't run a business with old data, with gut feel. You must see 
on a weekly basis where everything is going. And you can do that with systems that are there today. And if you don't like doing figures, then you really need to employ someone to do that. Yep. Because without a finger on the pulse, you don't know what's going on. And you can be surprised six months down the track. Whereas if you knew in the first month, you could adapt and change and readjust what you're doing. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Want to become the best manager you can be? Check out our Kick-Ass Manager course at growasmallbusiness.com. Do the course and add your fellow managers for no extra cost. Join the 30%. 70% of people quit their job because of their manager. And can you talk to how you've added people to the team, some wins, mistakes, and advice for those listening? Yeah, I think we touched on this before, but, um, you know, we've added people to the team because they're great mates or a friend has said, look, I really need a job. Um, Can't you employ my husband because he's got nothing else to do? There's been lots of reasons we've employed people um, and most of them have been for the wrong reasons. So it's very much a shotgun approach in terms of getting the right person on board. And we have got a couple on board that, you know, are still left over from the shotgun approach. But now we find that even though we go through a rigorous interview process and we appoint someone, it's happened twice now out of, I think, three, four times. They start the first day, they ring us at the end of the first day and say, I'm sorry, this isn't for us. Wow. At least they're self-selecting out at the beginning. Yep. So to me, that means we're doing something right Mm -hmm. rather than them being in there and us wanting to self-select them out four or five months down the track and then not being able to because we're stymied by, you know, um, relation laws with, with yep. business and staff and yep. so on. What are some things you recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? Selection of the right person to start with, the right people to start with, and then as a leader, um, communication. Yep. So uh, we... In our executive team, we know what we're doing. We know where we're heading, but we still don't relay that enough to the staff. So, you know, they can see own a fat ass person sitting on their ass in the office, you know, looking at their computer for the day while they're up doing, you know, the hard grunt mm. um, without understanding what we're actually doing. So whilst you don't need to share the minute with them, uh, you need to say, for example, I I was on the tools yesterday. And I said, look, I'm the, on the tools today, but what that's doing is stopping me writing this five hundred thousand dollar grant that I need to get in by Friday week. Yeah. So yes. yes, I need to do this today, but because you weren't at work today, that's why I'm doing this and not working on what I need to do to grow the business. So. Yeah. yeah. Good. And tell our audience how you've handled balance. Yeah. <laughs> balance is always a hard one you know they talk about work-life balance but there is actually some psychology around the fact that if you enjoy what you're doing then you don't necessarily need to leave it at the office when you go home it's that old saying choose choose a job you love and you'll never work a day in your life well exactly you know exactly i mean uh we used to do seven days a week and then the kids arrived and said that's bullshit (laughs) <laughs> you know, they were a different, different vintage to us and we ended up with a day off a week and that one day we'd go off and we'd, you know, pick up supplies for the business and yeah. stuff. But, yeah. I mean, now we all have two days off a week um, and I think we've got a pretty decent work-life balance and yeah. most of that has been imposted by the younger generation in the business, in our executive team. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They do it better than, than my age group. Yes, mm, I agree. So I'm the same. How much professional development have you invested in yourself over those last 19 years? <laughs> we can't swear on this, can we, Troy? I've sweared a shit ton already. <laughs> yeah. So well, fuck shit, shit ton. We, we've got three levels of weight. Yep. You know, the lowest is a shit ton and there's a shit load, then there's a fuck load. And imagine what the third one is. <laughs> it starts with C. Yeah. So... The one starting with C, um, and that's because in the beginning there there really was no sheep dairy industry in Australia. There essentially still is not. The ability to find out anything about sheep dairying wasn't available. I joined the British Sheep Dairy Association, 
got all of their manuals from 1987 on and every night I would read one and highlight what was relevant. Um, then I went around the world twice visiting sheep dairies of different nations, looking at how they ran the systems. Uh, why? Because it wasn't available in Australia for me. Mm -hmm. And I, if I'm not learning something, it's just who I am. If I'm not learning something new, then I guess I'm pretty bored. So, um, you know, I got turned on, as I said, by digital marketing. So I learned lots about that and so on and so forth. And yeah, always learning. Um, with the growth course that we did from South Australia, we learned a heap. So much so that we had to upskill so quickly that, you know, you get to that point where you start to hyperventilate because you've got so much information going in, <laughs> you don't yeah. know how to process it. So yeah. um, constantly learning, constantly. Um, when I go walking with my dog of an afternoon, I've got the podcasts on. Yeah. So yeah. I right. do podcasts. I love podcasts mm. uh, as a learning technique. Yeah. And, and yes, it might be business related, but I find that enjoyable. I'm walking. It makes me walk better because I'm engaged. Something exactly. Yeah, I'm than, you know, yeah, it's it's a really easy way of, of upskilling. Yeah. What about mentors or coaches along the way? I always wanted a mentor, but ha found it very hard to find someone that I valued as a mentor. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until we did the growth course in University of South Australia that I actually found several that uh, I could call on. Uh, when I needed it. So I don't actually have a mentor, but I do have now a suite of um, very good business people that I can call if I'm stuck on something and say, you know, what's your take on this? So it's like peer networking or peer mentoring, I guess, helping mm. everyone out. That's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What about, do you have a board of directors or advisors? No, we don't. Um, I mean, we have directors, but we haven't uh, initiated it as a full board and we... Uh, whilst we have some advisors around us in terms of our accounting firm is very, um, they're not like normal accountants, they're actually very proactive and very creative in all areas of business. So if we've got an aspect, we can ring them. We've got, you know, legal advisors, but as an advisory board, no. Yeah. And I think the reason for that, Troy, is again, because we have been, we have been the innovators in what we've done. You know, there was no sheep dairy in Australia, there, there was no sheep weight distillery. Um, it's pretty bloody hard to get advisors. And, and really between us, we've got three business degrees, accounting degree, financial degree. Yep. Uh, what, yeah. we didn't, what we should have had in the beginning was farming advisors. We're lousy farmers, but we couldn't afford them then anyway, so. Yeah, that's great. Well, Dan, we're on our final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? I think the hardest thing is actually getting a, uh, a top end view of what's going on because you're in the business, because you're living it and breathing it. Um, if you can find someone that has business skills much greater than yours and to do that, you would, they would need to have a successful business with high growth component. If they're willing to, look at all aspects of your business and say, look, these are the areas that we think need tweaking, need working on that aren't there. Um, that would be invaluable. I know that, um, you know, through Polly, uh, if a business is, a, I think you would have a turnover of a mill, that's the only thing, then you can get uh, a business advisor to come in and, and do a bit of a, a health check mm -hmm. on your business which can be useful. If it's under a, a mill, um, I'm really not sure how you would access. Yeah. Well, that's the entrepreneur's program, right. isn't it? I think it's 1.5 yes, it million. Is. Yeah. Yeah, 1. Yeah, 5 million minimum turnover. And there's a $20,000 grant as well that you can get as, uh, plus all the advice and advisors. Well, the, grant, the grant's at the end of that. So the first thing you've got to do is, and it, it's free, you get this business yep. health check, you know, where they look at yep. everything for you. And it is very good. Um, once you've done the health check, you can apply for the 20,000 grant, but it's dollar for dollar. Yeah. And we used ours for digital marketing. Great. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, it wasn't enough, but that's fine. It, it always helps. So, yeah. um, we used it for that, but what they'll do is they'll say, look, these are the areas of your business that really need to be upskilled. And then you can, you know, throw the 20 grand at that, but you've still got to be able to commit 20 grand of your own money. Into yeah. It as well. 
And while I think of it, did you want to, uh, are you happy with your accounting firm? Did you want to shout out to who that is in here in Tasmania? Oh, yeah, it's Collins SBA. Great. Yeah, I know Rob and Michael uh, there yeah. and Andrew was one of the partners as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and Nathan looks after us. They're, they're extremely um, innovative mm-hmm. in how they go about their business. Yep. And, um, you know, we smile a few times when we do the AGM because there's usually the next um, on sale, which, which is fine. You know, it's about, well, you know, to improve your business, maybe you should go and see this group as well and so yeah. on. But um, they were very instrumental in heading us down the path of R&D. Yep. You know, R&D research is like, oh, really, can't be bothered. Yeah, I know there's a bit of a tax break there, but not much. No, go and talk to mm-hmm. Monica at KPMG. Yep. Um, and, oh, my God, I mean, the dollars we've got back out of the tax department because yeah. R&D is what we do for a living. Yes. I mean, you know, we, we, we innovate products and we've never written it down. <laughs> so um, in the last couple of years, we've written it down and with her help, we've, um, you know, we've got some incredible dollars back out of the tax department for it. One of my key pieces of advice for those starting out, find a great accountant, hug them and never let them go. Mm. Yes, they are. They are very good. They're, they're, they're beyond being accountants yes. so they're yeah. what you want your accounting firm to be which is and, and they actually do have the ability to have a bird's eye view over your business yep um so yeah yeah no they're a good size certainly firm. you said for that yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're a good size firm 35 or 40 team members from memory they've got financial planning in there mm. as well as business advisory and usual accounting and auditing services yeah good firm yep. Yep. favorite business book which has helped you the most there have been many. Um, a couple of the randoms that people wouldn't know that are really just about um, getting into the creative space for creating wealth. Um, so, uh, n- you know, none of the obvious ones, really. Mm-hmm. From what you were saying earlier, I assume you also read Gerber's E-Myth? Yes, yes, that, that, was, that was interesting. Yeah, that was quite some time ago, though. And Marketing and Tribes, uh, Seth Godden? Uh, no, I haven't read that book, but yep. certainly it's very important to understand what is a tribe. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we we have a clear understanding of who our tribe is. And it's very important to nurture your tribe because they're the ones that will increase your business. Definitely. Yeah. They're the ones you need to talk to, not the tire kick. It's not the ones that might want to hear your story and not buy anything and aren't, really aren't part of your tribe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? Um, Mark Hammersley. Uh, it's Mark and someone else, but it's Mark Hammersley on, I think. Podcast one, I shouldn't. Can I say what the podcast is on? Um, Podbean. Right. Um, now, they're really good for e commerce. Um, upskilling and what i like about them is that you know they give you advice and tips that you can do yourself you don't need to grab a consultant they've got some really good uh, basic information on on how to go about e-commerce which i find really really useful um i also like lady brains mm-hmm. <laughs> um only, yeah, and the mentor with Mark Bordas. Now, both Lady Brains and Mark Bordas with the mentor are really interesting stories to listen to. Yep. I don't know that I necessarily upskill. But yep. I really enjoy hearing what other innovative businesses are doing and, you know, how they're, how they're getting ahead. The, the not many practical takeaways, though, although I do like how Mark Bordas swears almost as much as me. <laughs> yeah his his is more like a his is more like an oprah winfrey like, yes you know, like yeah really in, in, you know interesting but yeah. in terms of getting information out of it not necessarily so yeah i agree one tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business oh god there are so many and you need you need a few um i would certainly get a get across um there's a couple of tools out there about selecting the right staff, selecting the right team members. Yep. And, um, you know, you may have some podcasts, you know, on that, but that really is extremely critical. 
it's without the right team around you, mm -hmm. things start to go to hell in a handbasket. With the right team around you, they actually do the growth for you. So you can just say, you know, here's a great idea. This is what I'm working on. And you've, you've got all these people around you that are actually going in the same direction as you. Mm -hmm. and, and that can get really exciting and it's certainly extremely productive. Yeah, the one podcast I'd recommend on recruitment and management in general is Manager Tools, which is the number one business podcast on the internet. They've been going mm -hmm. about 16 years and their interview series, if you sign up as a licensee, I think it's 100 bucks, 200 bucks a year or something, you get ac access to their interview video series uh, as well as a whole lot of material and, and, a, and a tool to help you create the interview questions as well. So I always point people to Manager Tools, particularly when it comes to recruitment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and really any tool is better than none at all yeah. as well, you know, yeah. so, yeah. But, I mean, you know, I would, if I were, you know, I'd be looking at the, you know, the basic uh, podcast providers. Mm -hmm. um, and as you know, all you need to do is put in your area of interest yeah. and, and just listen to a couple of them and you will find that you will end up um, vibrating with you know one or two of the presenters and going oh that's what I love hearing and that's what I want to listen to yep um, so I, I don't think there's any one person for every business yeah mm. final my favorite question what would you tell yourself on day one of starting out this is going to be a pearl I'm sure <laughs> what I would say to myself is uh, hang on to the Jesus bars and, and just go for it <laughs> It's going to be a pretty rough ride. Yep. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks for your time today, Diane. I think the audience got a lot of value out of hearing your experience and the journey. And congratulations to yourself and, and the two kids as well. It's been uh, outstanding success and growth, particularly in the last few years. And I think the audience will really enjoy hearing that uh, journey. That's it. Thanks for listening. Please leave a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. It means more small business owners will find our cast and help people with their business growth journey.